Um, something just came to my mind as we as you were talking about primary data versus secondary data. There's this. Um, I I remember trying to make uh, come up with such an initiative for our little website for our organization um, to put the primary data that we're capturing um, that we're digitizing onto the website and I was met with um, a lot of resistance um, how t how are others dealing with this whole uh, intellectual property rights thing and uh, the authorities not wanting everything to be online because they feel they'll be bypassed mm -hmm. and no one will they'll become obsolete because yeah. everything is there so nobody's going to come looking for them it's a very very good question and a bunch of us remember back 15 20 years when these arguments were really really hot um, essentially the reasoning is I've spent a century taking care of this collection or I spent years assembling this data set. I know it's valuable, right? The data are valuable, the specimens are valuable. If it's valuable, I ought to be able to get some value out of it. And yet I never seem to get any value out of it. I mean, I take care of a pretty big bird collection and nobody's ever given me money to, you know, use the bird collection. Um, so where's the value in it? This is the thinking that goes on. Well, the last thing I'm going to do is just open the doors and let anybody come in and take the information who wants the information. Because that's giving away something valuable for free and without getting any benefit. And so the very interesting realization has been that many times the value is multiplied by the use to which the data are put. I mean, you can have an unbelievably valuable insect collection locked inside of a bank safe and nobody ever takes information away from it. Does it matter to the future of the world? whether that collection exists or not, if it's never used? I suppose not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That bank safe could be full of wood, or it could be full of beautiful insect collect collections. So the, my point is that it's a sociological transition where people start to realize, oh, People using and accessing and analyzing and publishing on our data does not reduce the value of our data. So that's the lesson. Now, how do you get that across to people? That's the hard part. Um, one of the best lessons is simply that there are 400 some institutions already doing this. And I know of no major problems of, you know, information theft or information misuse. Everybody around the world, this is the standard and the norm. Now there are discussions about intellectual property. But we can also ask, okay, that bug that was collected in the southeastern extreme of Zimbabwe, who does that belong to? The museum owns the specimen. But is that, is whatever intellectual content is in that bug the museums? Or maybe the local community or the nation? Many of us see biodiversity information as a common good. So it's simultaneously the property of the local community, the nation, the owner institution, and the world. Because it's all global biodiversity. So I'm not helping you concretely, but I'm giving you kind of a thinking framework. Um, institutions around the world have analyzed the degree to which they are able to assert ownership of information associated with biodiversity material 
and they've come to the conclusion that it's perfectly fine to open access. If anybody else has comments? John, let me come stand next to you. Uh, yeah, I have to stand next to you none, nonetheless. Go ahead. Um, I don't know anything about the, the legal side of intellectual property rights, especially because it varies in countries around the world. However, um, as Town said, we have been through this, this painful progression of collections not certain about sharing of their data. And at the beginning, there were many difficulties. Um, uh, institutions who had bad experiences in the past where they had shared their data and someone else then began to sell the data. In fact, selling it back to the institution that gave it to them to begin with. And this, of course, gave a very bad impression, bad precedent. So we had to overcome that in the beginning. And the way we did that was with a simple uh, strategy. One was to create our distributed database networks with those collections who had no doubts about sharing the data. They became the, the experiment, the example. The, the example. Will we survive? <laughs> Will everything be OK if we share our data? And we created very successful distributed database networks with those people. In the meantime, there were very large institutions who were uncomfortable with that. They weren't ready to take that step. They were uncertain, and they had several kinds of excuses why not to do so, including fairly lame excuses such as our data are not perfect. We don't want to share our data because they're not clean. Well, an institution like our National Museum, because it's so big, they're never going to be clean. There was an excuse to never share the data. But as they became, as it wasn't the real reason, I don't think. And as time progressed, and they saw all these institutions successfully sharing their data, and getting benefit from it, in fact, that had not been foreseen, we'll discuss that in a moment, they began to say, hey, OK, can we share our data in your networks also? So that now, with the vertebrate network, we're in a position where we cannot keep up with the demand to participate in the networks with open sharing. We are in a position in those networks at this moment of trying to get the institutions to commit formally to a data license, which has never been done before. Always before, we allowed them to create a statement about the use of their data if they wanted to do so. Basically, an intellectual property rights statement. But it had no legal foundation, and it had no way for the data consumer really understand what they were supposed to do and it varied from one institution to another. So in a big uh, aggregation the data user has a very difficult time to be responsible, to use it in a way that is responsible. So now we're trying to get the institutions to commit to a formal data use agreement, a, li a license, and we're promoting Creative Commons licenses. And in fact, we're promoting the most open of them, which is called a CC0, not even a license. It's a public domain dedication, which means these data are free for any use, period. That's what we're trying to promote. Some institutions, are actually a surprising number, are saying, yes, these data were collected under public funds. It is our responsibility to share them as public products. And they're doing so. The large majority so far is doing so. The bigger institutions, again, are a little more conservative. They're asking the questions in committees inside of their institutions. OK, this is a big step for us. So what do we do? What do we want back, et cetera? And so they're considering other alternatives that are open licenses for the use of the data, but requiring that the use be attributed. So if the data are used, you must say where they came from and what you use them for, which is a good alternative. It's harder for the data consumer to use those data, but at least it's clear how they can use those data, which is not the case if there's no license. And there, we can probably share some articles. There are a couple of very interesting blog posts about this problem. 
from the perspective of someone who wants to use data. It, and it makes it almost impossible unless you have the devices. 